you take your Bibles this morning and turn with me, if you would, to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. Mark, chapter 6. I hope that you're uh, excited about being here today and hearing God's Word. Uh, after all, uh, we just uh, went through uh, several days of revival and uh, had great services uh, in, in our revival time. Didn't you think so? And, uh, uh, I mean, how can you not when you have uh, six people saved and, and uh, uh, others join the church? And uh, that's a great revival, in my, in my opinion. And uh, um, if you missed it, you missed a blessing. Uh, but uh, revival services are over, but revival doesn't have to be. And uh, so... As we continue on, uh, I look forward to what God is going to do in the future. Tonight in our, in our service, I'm uh, going to give you a little bit of time just to uh, express uh, um, what God maybe spoke to you about or how God blessed you uh, during the revival services, so we'll take a little time to do that tonight. Uh, one of our youths is going to be singing tonight, and we're looking forward to that, and uh, uh, so uh, you... Uh, you be here just for that. Uh, it's always uh, uh, good to hear young people sing, and especially when it's their first time to, to sing in church. Uh, but uh, uh, we're, we're looking forward to it. All right. Well, how many of you uh, ever watched the uh, television show Jeopardy? How many of you know what the television show Jeopardy is? Okay, good. Because we're going to play Final Jeopardy this morning, okay? And uh, the category for Final Jeopardy is the Bible. All right? And the answer is this. Other than Jesus' resurrection... This is the only miracle mentioned in all four Gospels. I want you to think about it and write down your answer. You have 30 seconds to figure it out. Who thinks they have the answer? What is it? All right. Well, we know we got one Jeopardy person here because she actually did it right. You have to form it as a question. And so she said, what is the feeding of the 5,000? And that's correct. Of all of the miracles that Jesus performed... The feeding of the 5,000 is the only one that appears in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, I think there's a reason for that. I think it's because God wants us to pay particular attention to the lessons of this miracle. Notice the title of today's message is Minnows and muffins. And I really called it that on purpose. Because I want you to get the, the idea. You see, sometimes when we look at this miracle and, and we think about the miracle that Jesus took five loaves and two fishes, sometimes you might be thinking that that uh, Jesus took five loaves of Wonder Bread or whatever kind that you like that he had these five loaves of, of bread sandwich sliced and ready to go and that he had two catfish and that's what he fed the 5,000 with 
But I want you to think about it in a little different sense because I want you to think about it as being five little muffins. In fact, these muffins are made out of barley, which is the cheapest kind of flour that they could have made it out of. Somebody said that it was barley muffins at all. But this little boy has these five little muffins and a couple of, I used minnows, but we might call them sardines. Just enough to kind of get a little fishy taste on the bread. How many of you like sardines? Oh my goodness, I thought I had a smarter church than that. <laughs> so I called it minnows and muffins. I want you to think of it kind of like a Happy Meal. Okay? But I want you to also realize that Jesus took the Happy Meal and he supersized it and made it enough to feed a multitude of people. Let's read about it in Mark chapter 6, starting with verse 30. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place, and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of the cities, and out went them, and came together unto him. Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away, that they may go into the country round about, and into the villages, and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. And he answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread, and give them to eat? And he saith unto them, how many loaves have you? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set them before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of the frag frag fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about five thousand men. Now let me remind you of what happens leading up to this passage. You remember we started the chapter with Jesus going into his home city, the city of Nazareth. And you remember that he was not welcomed in his home synagogue. They ran him out. In fact, not only did they run him out of the synagogue, but they ran him out of town. And some of the people went out and they would have stoned him 
But he left, he and his disciples. And so they leave and they go in another place and Jesus sends his disciples out to do some work. And they come back and Jesus finds out that his cousin, John the Baptist, has been killed by Herod Antipas. And you know, Jesus, being God, he knew that was going to happen. But Jesus, being man, grieved over the death of his cousin. Jesus, being God, could go forever and never get tired. But Jesus, being man, got tired. And so he and his disciples are going to try to get away from the crowd who has been thronging them, and they're going to go north to the other side of Galilee. Well, the problem with that is all the people, if you've ever seen the Sea of Galilee, I have, you can pretty much see a boat as it leaves shore, and you could probably follow it to the next shore. And that's what they did. The people saw it and they followed and they went to the same place that Jesus and his disciples were going to to try to get away and get some rest. Now what would you have done? I know what I'd have done. I'd have said, let's get back in this boat and let's go the other direction and get away from these people. But that's not what Jesus did. The multitude was on the shore when Jesus got out of the boat. And there, he taught them. And he taught them until late in the day. And he looked out and he had compassion over the crowd of people because it was late in the day. They had left their homes. They didn't have anything to eat. Now, I've told you many times that there is a miracle in every parable and a parable in every miracle. And Jesus here was teaching a spiritual lesson in this miracle. He was teaching the disciples a lesson. That's why he went there. That's why he did all the things that he did while he was there. He was teaching a spiritual lesson. And later on, he gives the disciples a test, and they fail the test. Jump ahead in your Bible to verse 52, because there you'll see where they, where they fail the test, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Jesus taught the lesson, but later on, they couldn't remember the lesson of the loaves. They missed the point. And so my question today is, do you understand the lesson? Do you understand the lesson of the minnows and the muffins? In the story, there's three life-changing lessons about what you and I should do when we face an impossible challenge. You see, you may be facing something in your life that seems like it's impossible. You may be facing something spiritually that seems impossible. A sin that maybe has a hold of you and you just think it's impossible. You may be facing something physically that seems impossible. You may be facing something financially that seems impossible we're going to learn these lessons about what to do when you face an impossible challenge just three things I want to share with you number one never measure a problem in light of your own resources never measure a problem in light of your own resources. Let me tell you what my favorite part of this story is. 
I don't know about you. I don't know what your favorite part is. But I want to tell you that my favorite part, my favorite detail in this story is that there is an unnamed lad who got to enjoy lunch with Jesus. Can you imagine what that might have been like? We don't know the boy's name. We don't know who he was. But we do know that he got to enjoy lunch with Jesus. And I can imagine the rest of his life that he had a story to tell. You know what? I remember the time, how many of us old folks, that we start our stories that way. I remember when. And when he got older, I can imagine that he began his story. I remember... When a man took my five muffins and my two minnows and he fed a multitude of people. Folks, you and I, when we face a problem, our first reaction is to count our change and see if we can meet, a crisis, meet the crisis, don't we? Whenever you and I face a crisis, whatever it might be, we want to count our whatever to see if we can meet that crisis. Maybe I don't have enough money to pay my bills, but I'm going to count my change and see if I can meet this crisis. Peter Lord, who's 84 and still preaching, he he said there's three attitudes that people have as it relates to problems. First of all, there are some people who say, you know what, I feel like I should do this. Now I want you to look at our story. and Look at verse 34 with me to see what the problem was. In verse 34... It says, and Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, was moved with compassion toward them, and because they were as sheep not having a shepherd, he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desert place, now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Jesus said the problem was that they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were people who had no one to tell them and show them the direction to go. And now the disciples' response was, well, why don't you send them away into the city so that they can go into the towns and they can buy themselves something to eat? We don't have any way to feed them. There are so many people, Lord, that we, we're just going to panic. We're going to have fear because we don't know any way to take care of this problem. Let me ask you a question. When you face a problem, when you face a a crisis, when you face something that is bigger than you are, do you let your feelings be your guide? Do you go by a, a gut feeling? Say, you know what, well, I just believe, I just have a feeling that I ought to do this. Let me tell you something. You need to be careful where your feelings are because feelings can mislead you. Feelings can mislead you. Did you know that emotions are the shallowest part of your soul? And you know what, if you wait until you feel like doing something, you may never do it. How many of you have ever let something go because you don't feel like doing it? 
Let me give you an example. I have a storage shed in my backyard. The paint on that storage shed has been peeling now for a couple of years. And I've been saying, Mary, you need to get out there and paint that storage shed. And so far, she hasn't felt like it. And neither have I. And it's not that I'm sick. It's just, I don't feel like painting a building. Not something I enjoy doing. So guess what? If I wait till I feel like painting that building, what's going to happen? Wood's going to start rotting. And eventually that building will fall down. Listen, if you wait till you feel like doing something, if you wait till you feel like coming to God, if you wait till you feel like giving your life to Him, you are waiting too long. He says some people are figures. Some are figures. You know, I figure we could do this. You know, Philip was probably the CPA in the bunch because I want you to notice in verse 37 what he said. And he answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread and give them to eat? He was figuring the cost. He says, This is how much it'll cost to feed this multitude of people. He was a figurer. That's the way a lot of people approach a challenge or a crisis. What's it going to cost me to do this? What's going to cost me to do this? In one of the churches I was in, we were going to build a building. And a guy came to me and he said to me, he said, Preacher, he said, we're trying to raise X amount of dollars he said, I've got it figured out how we can do that. He said, if every person in our church will give $2,000, we can raise that money. And I said to him, I said, there's only one problem with that. Actually, he said, if every person on our church row, that's how he said it. I said, there's only one problem. No, there's two or three problems with that. One, half the people on our church row, we don't know where they are. They never attend. The FBI couldn't find them. Second of all, a lot of the people on our church row are children and youth. They don't have any way of giving $2,000. And the third problem is, there are some of our people in our church that for them to give $2,000 would be out of the question. They couldn't afford it. They're poor. They just can't afford to do that. And then there are some people in our church that could give way above that. There's nothing wrong with figuring. But listen, that's not the way to approach spiritual things. Because there's always some, this brings us to the third way of people do it, and that is, there's always some who say, I faith that God wants to do the impossible. I faith that God wants to do the impossible. I have to be honest with you folks, I've always gravitated to the faithers. I've always gravitated to people who said, we can do that. They say, here's a big challenge. And looking humanly at it, I don't know how it's going to happen, but our God is bigger than any challenge that we face. There's the old saying that says, where God guides, He will provide. Friends, that's true. 
And when you have a crisis in your life, when you have a problem in your life, you need to know that if God is guiding you to this place, God is going to provide. And I think the little boy in our story was a faither. I really do. They're looking around. They're saying, hey, we need some food to feed this 5,000 men. And that doesn't count the women and children. We need some food to feed them. And I can see this little boy. He runs up to, to one of the disciples, Andrew, and he says, Hey, hey, hey. Grabbing his coach, you know. He's saying, I've got two minnows and I've got five muffins. We'll get them fed. Now that's faith, isn't it? That's faith. We can do it. I think Andrew was a faither to a point. Andrew said, Lord, we've got these five muffins and these two minnows, but you know what? What are they among so many people? He was a faither to a point. The question for you are you living by your feelings? Are you living by figuring, got to figure everything out? Or are you living by faith? There was a lady living in a retirement center. And the newest resident of the retirement center was a nice looking gentleman. His wife had died sometime earlier. Well, one of the ladies in the retirement center, she saw him at the cafeteria table, and she asked him, she said, can I join you? And he said, sure. And she sat down, and she began to talk to him, and they had a great conversation, and finally she just started staring at him. And he said, why, why are you staring at me like that? She said, because you remind me of my third husband. And he said, well, how many times have you been married? She said, two. <laughs> now that's faith, isn't it? Never measure a problem in light of your own resources. Number two, the second lesson we learn from this is little becomes much in the hands of Jesus. The lad willingly brought his lunch. Little in quantity. Just some minnows and some muffins. But he gave it to Jesus, and Jesus used it. I believe that the lad took two steps of faith that you and I need to take to see God's power released in our life. First of all, we need to transfer ownership of everything that we have to Jesus. You see, the boy had come prepared. He had come prepared to have his lunch. And you know what? He could have snuck off and gone behind a rock somewhere and sat down and enjoyed his five muffins and his two minnows and life would have gone on. But he willingly handed it over. And God took it and used it to feed thousands. My friend, I don't know if you know it or not, but God owns all the wealth in the universe. Everything you have, you are just managing for God. God wants us to transfer ownership back to Him. Let me ask you, have you ever taken the time to consider all of your assets? 
Have you ever taken the time to sit down and consider that you have this asset and this asset and this asset and have you ever transferred ownership to God? Say, God, you own my house. You see, it's not you own it, it's not the mortgage company owns it. God owns it. Have you ever taken the time to consider your treasures and say, God, you gave me all of this. You own it already. I give it back to you. Have you ever taken your time and said, God, you've given me this much time. You're the owner of my time. I give it back to you. Have you ever taken your talents and said, God, I surrender my talents to you? You take them. You need to transfer ownership of everything you have to Jesus. And then Jesus transforms what you give him. And you give him more. Jesus took the minnows and the muffins and he made an all-you-can-eat buffet. Now I want you to think about this. If this boy had taken his two minnows and his five muffins, and he would have sat down and he would have ate those and kept them to himself, do you know what? He might have still been hungry. I mean, five little muffins... And two little minnows is not very much for a growing boy, is it? And he might have still been hungry. But guess what? When he gave it to Jesus, he had all he wanted and more. Do you know what Jesus does when you surrender all you have to him? He blesses it. He multiplies it. And he gives it back to you. But now, it has his power on it. And that makes a difference. That principle is found in a couple of places in the Bible. Found in a lot of places, but I just want to point out too. You remember when Mary, the sister of Martha, Jesus came into their home and Mary took a box of perfume, expensive perfume. In fact, the Bible tells us that it was a year's wages that it cost. And she took that perfume and she poured it on the feet of Jesus. And then she took her hair her long hair, and she unwound it. And she wiped the feet of Jesus. Jesus said that she did it because she knew what was going to happen in about a week. She knew he was going to be crucified. But guess what? She gave it to him. And you know how she was blessed? Because she had that scent on her for days after. You remember the story of Moses and his rod? And God asked him, says, Moses, what is that in your hand? And he said, it's a rod. And God said, throw it down. Moses said, no, it's the only thing I've got. God said, throw it down. And he threw it down, and what did it become? A snake. Moses ran. I would have ran too. I don't like snakes. But God told him to go back and pick it up. Now, I don't know. I think Moses probably hesitated in doing that a little bit. But he finally went back, and he picked up the rod picked up the snake, and it became a rod again. Now listen.
do you know what happened with that rod? That rod was a great blessing to Moses from that time on. It's with that rod that he struck a rock and water flowed out of it. Listen, have you transferred ownership of all you have and all you are to Jesus? You say, well, I don't have much to give. Well, friends, I want you to know he can take minnows and muffins and he can feed a multitude. Lastly, very quickly, God will create a need in your life to demonstrate that he can meet it. You see, that's what God is doing here. He's, he's demonstrating to the disciples that he can meet all of their needs. How many of you have ever taken a pop quiz in class? You walk into class, teacher says, take out a piece of paper and a pencil. I used to hate those. But friends, there's times when Jesus will test your faith just as he did in our passage. And when it comes to impossible situations and challenges, you need to look in three directions. Number one, you need to have hindsight. Hindsight. Looking back and seeing that God sustained you. You know, it's said that hindsight is 2020. You need to think back to a time of crisis or challenge in your life. And you need to notice how God was faithful and sustained you in that time. In the Old Testament, you find a riddle about problems in the life of Samson. You remember Samson? You remember that one time there was a lion that met him on the road? I, I like to tell the story. I think he was going to see one of his girlfriends. And the lion came out and met him on the road, and I think the conversation went like this, Kitty, get out of the way. And the kitty said, I ain't going to do it. I've got a girlfriend too, and I'm going to see her. So anyway, Samson and the lion, they get into a fight. And Samson kills the lion. Now, later on, Samson goes by that same direction and guess what the bees the wild animals have have devoured all the meat off of that line and all there is is skeleton there the bees have built a hive in that carcass of that line and there's honey there and Samson takes and puts his puts his hand in and he takes some and he eats it and it's sweet well later on there's some people who are trying to find out the strength of Samson. So he gives them a riddle. And the riddle he gives them is found in Judges 14, 14, where it says, And he said unto them, Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And they couldn't figure it out. But you see what Samson saw was in his past. In his past problem, he found the sweetness. And in your past problem, you can find the sweetness of God's Word and God's presence. That's hindsight. That's hindsight. But then there's foresight. Looking forward to the perfection of of heaven. You see, for the child of God, our ultimate destination is secure. My friend, there is nothing that is going to keep you out of heaven if you've given your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. Nothing. That ought to bring a smile to our faces in tough times. No matter what happens in a tough time, because heaven is secure. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. James Black penned a hymn in 1893 that says, 
on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of His resurrection share, when His chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there. Listen, that's our knowledge. That's our faith. Hindsight's easy. Foresight's glorious because you see heaven. But when you're going through the tough times, you need the insight. Which means that you're looking through your current crisis to see that all things work together for good. You see, it's in the middle of your problem that you need insight. Vance Havner used to say, when you're up to your neck in alligators, it's not the time to convene a symposium on how to drain the swamp. Folks, God has given us help and hope in the midst of our challenges. And we can claim Romans 8, 28. It says all things work together for good to them that love God. It's a powerful promise, friends. It's a powerful promise that everything works to good. Now, not everything in your life is good. I, I've likened it before and so many times that you probably turned me off on this, but it's kind of like your mama. Back in the old days, kids, you had this thing called an oven in your house. And your moms used it for something other than to put the potato chips in. They'd take lard, grease, flour, some raw eggs. They'd mix those things together and they'd make a cake. Put it in that thing called the oven. And it was really good when it came out. Now the deal is, none of us want raw eggs, unless you're maybe a bodybuilder or something. None of us like to just eat plain flour. None of us like to take a bunch of lard and put it in our mouths. But when you take those things and you mix them together, they're good. All things work for good. Friends, let me tell you something. God is the ultimate chef. And when he takes all things in your life and he puts them together, they work for good. Years ago, a famous violinist was scheduled to perform a concert using a Stradivarius violin. The concert hall was packed, and when he carefully moved the violin from the case, there was oohs and awes from the audience as they saw the priceless instrument. For the next 15 minutes, the musician thrilled the audience. He made the violin sound as beautiful as a mother singing a lullaby to her children. He could make it sound like the laughter of a child, the weeping of a woman. The people sat on the edge of their seat and they drank in every note. And as he finished the first section, the audience jumped to its feet and applauded. But to their surprise, their horror... The violinist took the instrument by the neck and he smashed it onto the stage. It shocked the audience. They were silenced. And he walked off the stage and returned carrying another case. And he opened it. He removed the violin and he said, This is the real Stradivarius. What I was playing before was a $50 violin. I bought it at a pawn shop. I just wanted you to know that it's not the instrument. It's the artist that draws the bow across the strings that makes the music. And he resumed the concert. But this time, the audience ignored the instrument and focused on the ability of the musician. Friends, that's just like us. We are all like a cheap fiddle. We think that we're just insignificant. Just a few muffins and some minnows. But my friends, in the hands of the Master, our lives become something beautiful. 
something lasting. So I wonder if you put yourself and all that you have into the hands of the Master. If you haven't, you need to surrender all to Him today. Sometimes we sing, I surrender all. All to Him I surrender. Would you surrender it to Him today? Because He can take what you have, what you are, and He can make beautiful music. Would you pray with me? Father, today, thank you for your word. Father, I pray that you've blessed it as we broke it. You've blessed it, multiplied it, and it's going to come back. Father, if there's someone today that needs to surrender all that they have and all that they are to you, you help them to do that today. As we give this invitation to you, you use it in Jesus' name.